Welcome to today's episode of Critical Mass Radio Show. I am your host, Rick Franzi, in studio today for our first segment is CEO and co-founder of Cirrus Path, Ryan Huff. The business talk show of Critical Mass Radio Show airs live on Tuesdays and Wednesdays at 4 p.m. and Thursdays at our special time of 3 p.m. All of our shows can be heard live exclusively on Orange County's only community radio station, octalkradio.net. If you're listening to the show as a podcast, we encourage you to listen live during our broadcast times. This show is brought to you by our advertisers, Brandman University, Center Club, Decision Toolbox, MBN Design, Smart Business Magazine, SNH Rubber, Succession Strategies, Tone Software, and UPS Protection. The goal for this show is to help you, our listening audience of CEOs running middle market firms, to improve your decision-making skills. We do that by interviewing business leaders, entrepreneurs, CEOs, who have experiences that you can benefit from experiencing and hearing about. Ryan, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Let's start. Tell me a little bit about you and your background. What, what have you done up to this point in your career that kind of have gotten you to this point in your career? Well, I am the CEO of Cirrus Path. Uh, we're a 29-person company based here in Irvine. Uh, we started the company 29 or uh, three years ago and uh, really started out with myself and my co-founder uh, since then it's been uh, it's been a great ride and uh, you know we're at a about a three and a half four million dollar run rate right mm -hmm. now and uh, you know growing the company but uh, you know what was your background sure so uh, before starting this I was running a uh, uh, consulting practice helping companies launch uh, new products on the salesforce.com app exchange which okay. is basically like the salesforce crm version of the apple app store right uh, i was also helping companies uh, get started and uh, up and running on salesforce.com itself mm. uh, basically tracking their sales activities and company information in salesforce uh, helping them move from either you know spreadsheets and uh, sticky notes or to from other CRMs okay so and uh, what did you do before that before that uh, software development so you've been in software development software all my life did you go to college for software development what's the story uh, yeah in and out I you know I think uh, you know my my major was business and economics okay uh, but uh, during college and, and immediately after I was also doing software development okay. on the side I uh, thought I would do computer science as a major but uh, ironically thought uh, hey you know I don't want to be sitting behind a, a laptop <laughs> at uh, late hours in the night coding away uh, uh, business is much more glamorous right but uh, you know so I ended up doing that as okay. well as uh, you know starting this which was always my what my was dream. the inspiration to start your firm so in working with uh, companies to move them to Salesforce to, to make hopefully make better decisions uh, by having all your customer data in one place right um, you know uh, some of our customers as, as well as ourselves uh, had the challenge of you know having all this communication in uh, email we were doing all of our, our consulting work remotely and so really uh -huh. it was over the phone and and mostly in our email um, where these conversations were happening the relationships were developing uh, and we struggled with getting all of that information into our CRM where theoretically that was supposed to reside right, yeah so makes sense. Uh, you know we had the idea that uh, you know, by bringing your CRM into your inbox, uh, we could make recording that information in your CRM easier. Uh, and by virtue of that, more people are going to use the CRM and more people are going to get value out of having that richer data okay. in your CRM. Uh, you know, as a practitioner of CRM best practices and, and uh, hopefully getting our customers up and running on that. Um, you know, we, we saw a lot of customers struggling with adopting yes. their CRM. Right. It's like an, it's, it's a bolt onto the business model, right? Absolutely. It's, yeah. It's, it's not, not what sales people want to do. It's not at the core. Hey, that too. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's not what sales yeah. people want to do. They want to be right. out there selling. Uh, and, and not telling anybody about it. 
Exactly, right? So business leaders are making the decision, hey, you know, we, we need more information. We right. need to know what's closing. We need to know what next quarter is going to look like. Uh, so, you know, CRM is the answer to our to our problems. Absolutely. Uh, but it's only as good as the data that gets in there. Right. And managers can only do so much to get that data in there. So what our product, Cirrus Insight, does is basically make it easy to get that that conversation that's happening in your inbox into Salesforce. That's one of the things that okay. it helps to do. And so really by, by putting it right in front of them all day long. Is that unique to your approach? It is. Okay. It is. So this so, is a point of differentiation. Then. Absolutely. Yeah. So really by, by bringing the CRM to your salespeople, rather than have your salespeople, you know, have conversations in one place and have to shift over to the CRM, right. They never do that, or if they do, it's it's the frantic Friday when they realize at three o'clock that they have to get all this stuff in so right. for their sales call on on Monday. They're ready. Um, so rather than that, we just make it very easy for them to get that information in there as it's happening, and uh, we bring that information back out to them when they need it. So okay. you open up an email, we yeah. bring you all of that CRM information right at your fingertips. So you know it's right there. You know at worst at the corner of your eye. And, uh, you know, hopefully it's, it's bringing information to you as such as, you know, number of deals that I'm working on with you if I had opened your, up the email. Okay. Uh, and, you know, what kind of customer support issues is this customer having? Things like that. Things that that information is in your CRM, but you're in your inbox. Right. So surfacing that information where you are. So the genius behind your business idea was to bring the CRM package into the inbox of the email system that the that their salespeople are already using and probably one of the more common packages of all the things in their computer that they use on a regular basis. Right. Everybody uses the email. Okay. And when you say email, I hear Outlook just because I'm sort of trained that way. So we launched uh, three years ago with a solution for Google Apps. So all of those companies that are using Gmail okay. uh, have been using our solution. Oh. And uh, we actually, thank you for the tee up, uh, yesterday launched a solution for Office 365. And I had no idea, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> so, That's great. Yeah. So we're so very excited opens up about a whole that. other market then, right? Uh, an I enormous mean, market. Enormous market, right? A lot of embedded. Okay. So you got Gmail and uh, an Outlook Office 365. So you kind of got the And the iOS. Titans. And okay. uh, we're working on Android as well. So you okay. know, the, the number one app that you're working with on your phone uh -huh. is probably your email. Yes, it is. 40 times a day, salespeople are opening that up, app, okay. app up. And it's the same, same problem, if not even more pronounced in that environment. You know, how do you get to your CRM on your phone? <sighs> right. So uh, we bring well, that. How do I input the data into it? Exactly. And, yeah, just, yeah. So okay. how, do we, how do we bring those two worlds together? And that's okay. what we do with serious insight that's great i mean that's uh, a critical insight that you had clever name right i can <laughs> see it. it's all coming together ladies and gentlemen ryan huff is our guest and we're going to take our first commercial break here on critical mass radio show when we come back i'm going to talk to him a little bit more about the app and how it works what is it doing for business as far as communications so if you're a ceo of a middle market company who is frustrated because you're uh, CRM and deployment hasn't gone as planned, or you're considering it and you want to make sure it's successful, I think you want to stay around for this next segment. Maybe you'll get some insights and ideas on how to make it a successful project. We'll be right back after these words from our commercial sponsors. Can we talk about your family business? You know, that thing you put your whole life's blood, sweat, and tears into? Well, what happens when you retire or try and pass that business on to your children? At Succession Strategies, we can help you find the answers. We'll guide you through the unsettling process of protecting your family legacy and successfully passing your business on to the next generation, safely and securely, ensuring that it'll both survive and thrive for generations to come. So ask yourself just one question. Can I really afford to wait? Take the first step. Take our complimentary self-assessment at SuccessionStrategies.com or call us at 714-560-9022 
to set up a free consultation at your convenience. That's succession-strategies.com. Today's businesses are embracing voice over IP telephones and unified communication desktop technologies to more effectively communicate and collaborate with their customers, suppliers, and colleagues. The Reliatel management software from Tone Software Corporation helps organizations of all sizes manage their communications technologies to ensure great voice quality and better levels of service and reliability throughout their business. Through Reliatel, you'll gain higher return on investments from VoIP and unified communication technologies while lowering the associated operational support and maintenance costs. Learn more. Visit www.tonesoft.com or call 800-833-8663 for information on Reliatel by Tone Software, the solution for quality business communications. Hey, did you know that over 73% of consumer packaged goods and retail products fail miserably within their first year? Why? Because they find themselves in the pit of unawareness. You don't want to go there. Call me, and I'll make sure that your packaging gets noticed. You know how I know? Because I'm the founder and creative director of MBN Design. We're one of Orange County's most established and trusted design firms. With over 20 years of experience, I can ensure that your brand will always stay new. Ask me how our packaging sold millions in months or see for yourself other success stories on our website at www.mbndesign.com. We're MBN because we're making brands new. Call 714-458-8701 and talk to me, Hector Garcia. That's myself. 714-458-8701. I'll be waiting for your call. Welcome back to this edition of Critical Mass Radio Show. I am your host, Rick Franzi. Ryan Huff, CEO and co-founder of Cirrus Path, is in the studio, and this is our segment segment with him. But before we get back to it, I'd like to thank and acknowledge our listeners who download our show as a podcast. Over the last 30 days, you've downloaded over 16,000 episodes of the Critical Mass Radio Show series. We here at the program appreciate your continued and growing support. All of our shows can be heard live on octalkradio.net or rebroadcast anytime from Apple iTunes, Stitcher.com, Spreaker.com, and over, well, 700 different websites where past guests have placed their version of the radio show on their website for people to find and listen to. All right, Ryan, let's talk a little bit more about the product, the Cirrus Path Insight. And how does that change the communications or create new connections of communications within the company. Well, what have you seen? Big companies are using your platform. Yes. So you're, you've got a, a wide range. The biggest of the bigs are sure. using your platform as well as entrepreneurial lower middle market companies. So just explain to the CEOs of middle market companies what your tool can help them to do from a communications perspective. Sure. So, you know, we've all we've all heard of the the promise that CRM has of being able to have that 365 degree view, 360 degree view of uh, your customer. So knowing how they came in, which which lead, uh, which marketing program they came in through, uh, you know, how did they qualify, how quickly, who, which salespeople worked with them, uh, which partners have worked with them, what kind of customer support issues have they had over the, the period of time. And having all of that information really at your fingertips. Pull up an account, I can see all of that. That's all great, and we've all... It's very uh, enticing. It's very enticing. Um, but the problem has always been, uh, in our view, a, a data entry problem, right? So I agree. how do you get that information into your CRM? It doesn't just happen. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't just happen with, you know, uh, you, you put some kind of JavaScript library on your website and things just start happening. Um, salespeople have to enter it in. And salespeople don't like entering data into CRM. Generally they be speaking, out right. Yeah, it right. feels redundant. Right. right, absolutely. So they want to be out talking to customers. They want to close deals. So how do we get th their CRM uh, really in their hands more often? How do we make it easier? How do we eliminate the friction of getting that information that, that's happening either on the phone or in your, in your inbox uh, into your CRM more reliably right. so management can make better decisions. Right. So uh, And more timely. 
Absolutely. Right? More we're, timely. It's not at the end of the week. Right. It's we not, were talking about how p- it, people procrastinate and absolutely. then they try to catch up and you never do as good of a job right. and you're in catch up mode. Things slip through the cracks. Right. You put the bare minimum in many times, right? Absolutely. Okay. So we, you, you lose information that way. You lose quality of information. You lose the quantity of information. And so, uh, you know, the solution we found was make that easy make that information easy to get into the sa- to into Salesforce in this case. So, uh, you know, we launched three years ago with a solution for Google Apps, for right. Gmail. Uh, we launched a few weeks ago, a few months ago actually now, uh, with a solution for iPhone, and okay. we're coming out with something for iPad in the next uh, couple weeks. Okay. And uh, yesterday, again, we launched with Office 365. Mm-hmm. So, really, if you're using Salesforce.com, uh, you are almost assuredly uh, suffering from some some level of an adoption problem. Um, you know, you're not getting quite as much out of it as you thought you would when you embarked on that project. And uh, you know, your your executives could certainly benefit from getting better information. It, it seems uh, you sold me to this point that it would seem like a waste of the investment not to take the next step and incorporate your product into the platform. I'm glad. Because having lived through several CRM implementations in my career, the They're promise the promise is hard to realize. That's right. It just and and it the promise is so attractive to the decision makers that aren't in the day to day. Yeah. It just it's it's a shame. Yeah, and it's a it's a question about ROI, right? You've right. spent a lot of money right. on Salesforce. Salesforce is expensive. Uh, to, but to maintain too, right? To it's maintain, an ongoing. It's right. every month you're writing a check or that's paying right. the bills. You're, you're training your salespeople. You're paying a, a consultant, like in my prior life, <laughs> yeah. to set it up to <laughs> keep it working. Yeah. Uh, so you're putting a lot of money into it, right? And uh, you know, we help to to yeah. actually attain that. And the salesforce just wants to wait you out. Well, if we just be obstinate enough, maybe they'll give up and there'll be another shiny ball to CEO will chase, and yeah. they'll leave us alone again. And then you made all that investment, and you get. Worse data than you right. maybe you did. You put a lot of money systems. into getting it up and running, and it's it's hard to walk away from that. It is. Yeah, you get very pregnant with it. All right, let me ask you about your guiding principle. Here on a radio show, we ask our guests periodically to share their guiding principle. And for me, that's you've learned a lot, Ryan, in your career. What have you taken from your experience that you're applying directly into how you and your partners are growing and building your firm? It may sound uh, a little cliché. Uh, I think, but I, I think the number one thing I've learned is surround yourself with with good people, uh, with better people, um, and that doesn't mean just employees hire the best. Um, although we do, and uh, you know we're we're very lucky to have some really great people on board, um, but also advisors. I think that's really critical. Uh, you know, this is the the first startup. Uh, I ever started, right. and uh, you know we certainly don't have all the answers. So, from a very early on, we we started looking for advisors and started looking for people who had been around the block and could mm-hmm. give us really salient advice. And um, you know, I think our job as as the entrepreneurs is to to take that advice and make a decision. Uh, right. And I think that's the other thing that. I think has really helped us differentiate ourselves out there is just simply being able to make decisions quickly. Um, they're not always the right decisions, uh, but we're making decisions, and in the cases where, where there are mistakes, we're learning from those mistakes and quickly adjusting and correcting and finding, hopefully, maybe eventually, right. the right path. Well, there's certain things you can't learn until you start doing. Absolutely. So you got to make the decision, get in the game, get the early feedback, figure out if you how close you are to what you the desired result it was. You can spend forever thinking about it, but you never really know. You know, planning is important, and I wouldn't say don't plan, but I think implementing doing. and doing and yep. being creative with the, with the results far more important to an entrepreneurial company than all the planning. Pla- Absolutely. I mean, but you should plan. But not too much. Just enough to have confidence that you should try to do something, right? Know where the first step is going to take you. Exactly. And it's a uh, journey. Yeah. That's the great thing about being an entrepreneur is that, you, especially when you're creating a new company and doing all that stuff, the, there's no footprints. 
Absolutely. You, but like you said, having some advisors around who can maybe sort of shape that a little bit. Yeah. I like that's why we do the show so that the listeners can adapt or adopt what they hear. Absolutely. Hey, I think I can take what Ryan said and and, and when I have people like you on the show, CEOs who have products that my audience could benefit from learning about, I get a double benefit from having Absolutely. you on the program because I, I'm excited to think that if you can bury the CRM inside your Outlook or your email inbox, that's the place where I am most times. And if I'm going to put any data in the system, I'm most likely to do it right then and there. Yep. Right? Yep. Just fire off the email. It's picked up. All the. I mean, it's just... So logical. Yep. I'm surprised Thank it's you. not a part of the that, package already. Yeah, you mentioned you, you mentioned genius idea. I don't know that it was a genius idea, but it, <laughs> it, it worked. So, well, some of the uh, simplest ideas right. are the most powerful. That's right. Right. That's right. And it's a and it takes an entrepreneur to see that. Yeah. And you did it through your experience. And it's been a great ride. It's been a lot of fun. And uh, twenty nine people. Twenty nine people. That's, That's right. That's an impressive it number is. of I'm folks. I'm very proud of that. And, and in your space, I have to believe those aren't 29 inexpensive people. Not at all. In the software space, right? Uh-huh. There's yeah. competition in Orange County for that kind of talent. So, Absolutely. You know, you, you've built something to be proud of. And with the it sounds like you've got a lot of headroom yet. We've got a lot, a lot of things that we can do in the space. I think, you know, email and CRM are two really fascinating areas. Um, and that's why there are people like me, people who find that kind of stuff fascinating. Right. Uh, but, uh, you know, there's a lot of really interesting things we can do with it, and, and uh, our customers are giving us great feedback every that's single day. The, that's the key. If you're that type of supplier and partner, and the customers will give you ideas. Some Absolutely. of them won't work. You've got to filter those out. Not all of them are great. But some of the best ideas, I think, come from the observations of the people who use your platform. Absolutely. Before, before we even launched the product, we had uh, customers on a beta, and we had them sending feedback to us every single day, and we do that to this day. So wow. it's, it's critical. Well, we're out of time, and I apologize. How does somebody find out more about your firm online, Ryan? Uh, go to cirrusinsight.com, and that's C-I-R-R-U-S, like the type of cloud. Beautiful. Uh, insight.com. All right. Well, we're going to have to have you back at some other point because there are other things I'd like to learn and talk and share with you because you, you're you in a very active space and something that's very appropriate for CEOs of middle market firms across North America. Thank you, Ryan Huff, CEO and co-founder of Cirrus Path. I really appreciate you giving, coming into the show and being a part of the program. Not at all. Happy all right. to be here. That's have a, a good fun. day, my friend. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take a short commercial break here on Critical Mass Radio Show. And then Dr. Chip Espinoza, professor and author of Millennials at Work, the seven skills every 20-something needs to know to overcome roadblocks and achieve greatness after these words from our sponsors. Imagine what it would feel like to lose everything, your job, your home, your family, your dignity. This has happened to thousands of the men, women, veterans, and young adults we serve at Working Wardrobes. What do we do to help? We provide career development services, life skills workshops, job skills training. We provide the perfect interview outfit, and we get clients placed in jobs. Call Working Wardrobes, 714-210-2460. Donate, volunteer, invest, hire. If you are an Orange County CEO or a business owner, this message is for you. Do you ever feel isolated with no place to turn for advice or feedback? Who holds you accountable to your commitments in your company? Where do you find the right resources to help you and your company grow? If you have had these questions, then Critical Mass for Business might be the answer for you. Critical Mass for Business is committed to helping you make better decisions through the power of peer learning. These are groups of peers who are running businesses just like you. CEO Peer Groups provides a great sounding board to test fresh ideas and new concepts, review your strategic plans and tactical goals, and present issues and opportunities for a critical discussion. The result is improved strategy, accountability, and improved business results. If you are interested in learning more, go to www.criticalmassforbusiness.com and learn about our CEO Peer Groups. CEO Peer Groups is a registered trademark of Critical Mass for Business. SNH Rubber is a manufacturing company in Fullerton, California. We specialize in custom molded, extruded, and stamped rubber parts. If your next job requires a rubber part, we would appreciate the opportunity to quote on it. We serve aerospace, automotive, and many other industries. 
We work with many types of rubber, including silicone, EPDM, neoprene, buninitrile, and Viton. Our quality system is ISO and AS9100 approved. Over our 47 years in business, the SNH brand has become known for superior quality, quick turnaround, and competitive pricing. Please check out our website at www.shrubber.com or call 714-525-0277. Let SNH be your ceiling solution. When it comes to pioneers in their respective industries, we all know the Apples, Starbucks, and Trader Joe's of the world. In the realm of recruiting, Decision Toolbox is the industry's best-kept secret. With 90% of their business from referrals and repeat customers, for over 20 years, Decision Toolbox's U.S.-based team of recruiters, sourcers, professional writers, quality personnel, and tech support has perfected a Six Sigma approach to talent management. No matter the size of the project, Decision Toolbox delivers incredible results. A cost per hire less than half of what contingency firms charge. With the winning candidate presented in an average of 14 days. All with a 12-month candidate warranty. With results like that, Decision Toolbox won't be a secret for long. Visit us at www.dtoolbox.com for more information. And welcome back to this edition of Critical Mass Radio Show. I am your host, Rick Franzi. Our audience demographic is 98% business owners and executives who listen to learn from our guests. If your firm is interested in reaching these top decision makers, then advertising on the radio show may be the answer. Each month, our sponsors gain valuable exposure to their support of the program. And with our exclusive prospect engagement program, we deliver up to 23 warm prospects to each of our advertisers each year. To learn more, contact Rose Chamora at 951 515 4661. All right, as promised before the break, Dr. Chip Espinosa is here. He's a returning guest. We had him on earlier to talk about his original book, at least in this series, Managing the Millennials. And now we're talking about his second book, The uh, Millennials at Work The Seven Skills Every 20 Something Needs to Know to Overcome Roadblocks and Achieve Greatness. Chip, welcome back to the show. It's great to be back. Thanks for the invitation. So for those of you who maybe didn't hear the first interview we did with you, tell us a little bit about who you are, your background, your experience, what you're doing. Well, one of the reasons I got interested in this, uh, I'm a university professor teaching management theory and practice, and I noticed a difference between my students in the 90s and the 2000s. In the 90s, you'd hand out a syllabus first day of class, they'd just put it in their backpack and never look at it. In the 2000s, they'd take it out, get a red pen, get their attorney on the line, and go line by line through it. And okay. They'd have questions like, well, 10 to 12 page midterm is 10 pages of C, is 12 pages in A. Oh, my God. So with this generation, I loved them. i got to tell you this. I, I, w- I really enjoyed it, but to them, everything was negotiable. So syllabus was just a starting point for a discussion. Did they ever come back and say, you know, my parents said on this syllabus. (laughs) Exactly. Well, what's funny about it, so then I noticed in companies I was working in, organizations, there was some tension between generations. And so I said, I wonder if this is kind of pervasive out there. And so I did the research for managing the millennials, which showed there are some intrinsic values that millennials have that um, caused them to be perceived a certain way by managers. Right. So when that came out, you know, all of a sudden I had companies calling me and saying, hey, come and help us. And almost every time they said, well, do you have anything for the millennials themselves? And I said, well, yeah, I, I'm thinking about it, but it stands to reason. You know, I observed a phenomenon in the first book to say, okay, tension in the workplace, what's going on intergenerationally here? Right. And kind of drilled it down in my research to a theory. So then I stopped and I said, well, if millennials are perceived a certain way in the workplace, starting with, you know, a theory, could I observe a solution? And Mm. so that's what millennials at work is. It's saying, okay, here's the perceptions, whether whether they're true or not, doesn't matter, because they create a reality. Right. And so perceptions like being entitled, abrasive, all these different things, defensive, so, and they're treated a certain way, then they face roadblocks. And sure enough, that came out in the research. So... You said you did research. How long did you do the research? Research took me uh, about a year and a half. Okay. And I did it with 750 professional millennials. Wow. So one of the things, that I, Richard, that I love about my work is that, you know, I hear a lot of programs, you read a lot of stuff. It's a discussion about millennials. 
and my my commitment is to have a discussion with millennials and so one of the right. things I'm finding is traction with that population to go this isn't just some guy out there attacking us this isn't somebody just kind of making up all this generalization but sitting down and having a conversation with them so I had like 750 working professionals from around the world is international probably about 50 companies represented in that hmm. and what was fascinating when we do research there's something that's called you know where, where you have theoretical saturation and it, it, within a hundred interviews I was seeing common themes in the roadblocks okay that's classic well let's get let's get in a little bit more in the content of the book so um, our audience our CEOs running middle market for lower middle market firms hundred million dollars two million that kind of range I, our demographics suggest that most of them are the baby boomer age bracket you know 45 to kind of 65 right. so why what would they learn from reading your newest book Millennials at work well I think they would be able to immediately see where Millennials are challenged where they're frustrated Okay. okay, and so to understand that you could really step in and help them through specific things for instance one of their biggest number one thing they realize they lack experience so the number one challenge they face and profess to chase is I have a lack of experience right. and what does that get in the way of it gets in the way of opportunities for them right and so if you know that about them sometimes their lack of patience is the result of understanding they just don't have the experience to get what they want out of work okay so you come alongside them you go hey let's help you get the experience you know, right. just sit tight. We'll, we'll, we'll career development. We'll put you on a track. We'll cross train you. All this kind of stuff. Um, what about introducing them to a mentor? Absolutely. To help yeah, with their that, that is matter of fact, I'm doing a mentoring conference uh, at University of New Mexico this fall, really to talk about okay. this work. Okay. But yeah, absolutely mentoring. Um, and what I'm finding in that literature, Richard, is in, in, interesting is that somebody to learn with not necessarily somebody has expert right. advice right. that we build this relationship and you dump it into me but somebody that's really playful and doesn't mind being challenged or questioned more like a collaborative yeah, absolutely. effort than a traditional mentor mentee kind of an idea right. okay that's interesting because um having held a couple seminars on where i facilitated successfully managing millennials in the workplace one of the things that that I think I've learned from that conversation is that they're not going to change. It's 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 not like we look at these and, and everything right. that they do that we don't that what we perceive as different than us is only a function of their lack of uh, uh, seniority, time, and right. right, and that sooner or later they'll yeah. come around. I mean, these are these are these are hardwired. Uh, characteristics of this generation. A a absolutely, absolutely. Now, the one thing that I do say to them, though, cause you can imagine, my, one of my first calls was go do a conference. This guy read my book, Managing the Millennials, and said, "Hey, come and tell our crowd how millennials are perceived." And I said, "Well, how many are there?" And he says, "A hundred." And I said, "What are their ages?" He said, "They're all millennials." I said, "What? You want me to get shot?" <laughs> right. <laughs> and he says, "No, I, they need to hear this." And so the fascinating thing is. You're right, but the one thing I challenge them is that you may be perceived this way. You may have these values. We, I, I personally believe the people with the most maturity have to adapt first in a situation. Right, right. However, I tell millennials, if you want more responsibility, you'll be willing to adapt. Okay. And so there is a role for them. There is a place. I'll give you a good example. Number one, one of the best things I could ever give an advice to a millennial, show appreciation when somebody does something nice for you. Don't take it for granted. Okay. Most everybody in your life up to this point has been for you. And they do things for you, not expecting you to thank them. But you get into the workplace, and a boss says, hey, why don't you accompany me on this sales meeting? And you go, and you don't say, hey, thanks for that opportunity. Right, I really learned something. Thanks for what you taught me. you got to do that. Right. Wow. Well, um, I think, though, that there are some qualities that I have heard through these seminars in your books that... Um, that millennials possess some amount of qualities that I think are superior to the baby boomers. I, I, my sense is things matter more to them about the quality of the work that they do, the purpose of the work that they do, the purpose of the company that they work for. They almost have a higher expectation of why am I doing this work than maybe many mille uh, baby boomers who were happy to get the job and just work, work, work. No, I, I, I agree. And sometimes get taken advantage of. And, and guess what? I have a theory on that. Okay. It's not really my theory. It's Maslow's theory. Yes. If you look at builders who entered the workforce 
during the Depression, they went to work. Their motivation was just to provide food, clothing, Survive, and shelter. Right. When boomers came on the scene, expanding economy, growth of you know disposable income, they wanted belonging. They wanted titles. They wanted a place. Today, when millennials come in the workforce, they're at the top of Maslow's heart. Wow. They want meaning. All the other needs are satisfied. Exactly right. right. Wow. And so you look at it and you go, this makes sense why a builder would say, I don't understand why a paycheck's not enough to motivate them. Right? Mm-hmm. And for the millennial, go, well, it just isn't. I want more. So, it is your opinion that, not or put words in your mouth, let me ask you, is it your opinion that by blending the traditionals, builders that are left in the workforce with baby boomers, with Generation X, and figuring out how to capitalize on these new skills and talents of the millennials, that a middle market company is going to be even more successful? Um, I, I don't think the size really matters. I think it's the commitment to it. Okay. I think that any organization, whether it's a mom-and-pop real estate office or it is a Fortune 50 company, if you commit yourself to create relationships between the generations, make that important to understand one another and understand that we can create environments where all generations can thrive, right. I think anybody can be successful with this. I, I, I see it all the time. I see people that are 80 years old in companies who were phenomenal at working with millennials. Hmm. And you'll find millennials who can't manage other millennials. So a lot of this has to do with a commitment <laughs> to relationship and right. a commitment to hear each other. Now, here's, here's the most important thing. This is what makes everything successful, is that I think what we're having is a greater tra- one of the greatest transfer of knowledge in the history of the world between boomers because of these large birth cohorts right. in the next 10 years. And, and it's tacit knowledge. It's, it's knowledge that's learned through a lifetime, through work, experience. And, if, and tacit knowledge only gets transferred through relationship. So if you have a breakdown mm. in relationship, that's the competitive advantage. That's the investment that wow. organizations will lose if they don't prioritize this. Well, so we're talking with Dr. Chip Espinoza. He's a professor and author of Millennials at Work, as well as uh, the book before that in the series, Managing the Millennials. We're going to take a short commercial time out here on Critical Mass Radio Show, and we're going to come back and talk more about his latest book after these words from our sponsors. There's something positive about the word up. When things are looking good, they're looking up. When someone's down, you cheer them up. So how do you move up? Well, when it comes to getting your bachelor's or master's degree, there's one university that stacks up, Brandman University. Brandman is ranked by U.S. News and World Report as one of the nation's top ten universities for online bachelor's programs. Brandman's online graduate programs in business and education also receive top honors. So look us up at brandman.edu. Brandman University. Move up. Smart Business Network is a business-to-business multimedia company providing insight, advice, and strategy for C-level executives of fast growth, middle market, and large companies. As one of the nation's largest publishers of local management journals, under the Smart Business name, Smart Business Network publishes 19 regional print editions, presents dozens of large and small-scale business conferences and award programs, and produces a vibrant interactive digital media presence. For more information, visit us at www.sbnonline.com. UPS Protection has been protecting systems in the U.S. against brownouts, blackouts, and poor quality power for over 25 years. We provide power protection systems, including UPS, lighting inverters, generators, and service for clients from coast to coast. We specialize in solving all your power needs. As a direct reseller of the best brands in the industry, including Liebert, Powerware, and APC, we can solve all your power protection needs. Protecting your power is our main goal. We offer on-site or depot repair of our critical equipment. To better serve your budget constraints, UPS Protection also offers both reconditioned and new products. Welcome back to this edition of Critical Mass Radio Show. Dr. Chip Espinoza, professor and author of Millennials at Work, is our guest for this segment. But before we get back to the interview, I want to thank and acknowledge our listeners who download our radio show as a podcast. You've downloaded over 16,000 shows during the last 30 days, and we here at the program appreciate your continued and growing support. All of our shows can be heard live exclusively on octalkradio.net, as well as rebroadcast on iTunes, 
Stitcher.com, Spreaker.com, and hundreds of business websites where our former guests have put the player on their website so that people could hear their interview on Critical Mass radio show. Let's talk about respect. In, in your research in both books, what do you find are some ways that senior executives and millennials can build mutual respect? Well, I think, first of all, they need to prioritize building a relationship. And I think, I'm asked this frequently to say, doesn't every generation kind of have a problem with the next generation coming along? Isn't this all the same I thing? Think, yeah. Right? Well, to some degree it is. It's called demographic metabolism. Every time an older generation goes out and a new one comes in, there's, there's opportunity for tension. Why I think this is very different, to some degree, or unique, is that the millennial is the first generation who has not needed an authority figure to access information. So they don't have a felt need to build a relationship with authority like previous generations. Matter of fact, an authority figure may be the last place they go <laughs> for an answer. And so, you know, people that are do older sitting back... Do wait. they distrust authority figures in business? No, I, research su- I don't think so. Okay. No, not so they're all. not biased against it. I they're think just it's just a matter of... Th- it, this is they don't of, need it. It's a, yeah, it's a stalemate because then you have a generation of managers out there who don't think it's their responsibility to initiate a relationship with a subordinate. Hmm. So they're waiting for their subordinate to come talk to them, ask them questions, and when they don't come, the manager goes, they must think I'm an idiot or I'm antiquated. Yeah, exactly. And so what happens is you have this kind of this generation that doesn't know how to reach up and a generation that doesn't know how to reach out. And so what happens is we kind of mind read each other. Millennials get this. They know one of the biggest uh, challenges that they stated was miscommunication with older workers. Hmm. They knew that about themselves. Right. And so one of the things in the book I talk about, for them, a strategy, a skill, uh, Richard, if you contacted me, and, and if you called me, then the way I would respond to you was with a phone call. Okay. If you texted me, I would text you back. If you emailed me, because we primarily communicate in our favorite mode of communication. Right. So I'm saying to a millennial, if you want to build a relationship, however you're communicating with communicate in that same style until you build the relationship where there's a comfort to communicate in different ways. There's one thing I hear over and over from managers is these people can't pick up the phone. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, it's more expedient to text. They, you know, in the book we show these statistics, they don't even like to email. You know, it's texting basically. So, one of the things for them is that. Now, for somebody who's a manager or a, a person in the company has responsibility who's older, One of the things I say to them to build this relationship, let's suspend the bias of your own experience. That's hard. It is hard. But stop and don't say, this is the way I did it or we did it. What's wrong with you? Exactly. Right. And and, and compare them all the time to something they have no clue about. Right. So if you say, if I suspend that bias and I go, okay, what, what do I need to do to change, to connect with them, to build a relationship? Then we find out, hey, you know, there's there's actually things that we can do. Okay, so your first book, Managing Millennials, targeted to the senior executives, presidents of firms, to understand how to discover the core competencies for managing today's workforce. Your new book is really written for the millennials to, to help them with seven skills that they, they, exactly. can, they can learn to be successful. So are these two books seem like a perfect complement for family business, where maybe mom and dad are boomers and the right. s- children or millennials uh, w- have you seen that I, I think would you recommend them well you to hit read the you, book? you hit the nail on the head I get asked so many times after I speak particularly by a family businesses who say we're looking at handing the business off but we're we're afraid right they don't seem to have the same values we have and that scares us and so it, it would be incredible for both of them to read it and sit down and have a discussion right and, and then read each other's book yeah Right? Yeah, right, to get a better, to get a third-party view. Well, that's the funny thing about millennials at work, though. It's written for millennials. Managers are they, they're go- they love it. So when does a millennial, when does that generation stop being? When a new kid's being born, no longer millennials. Well, yet. right now we're looking at anybody born after two thousand and one. Uh, okay, they're referred to as Gen Z, IY. Homeland generation. So, so th- there hasn't been a term that's been agreed to for that. It's not well, landed yet. And matter of okay. fact, you know, when we're, we're talking millennial a lot here, but when they first came on the scene, the, the, probably the term that was most used was Gen Y. Right. Because we had Gen X. Right. Right. And then Y. Okay. So that's the lot there, but millennials is a much more splashy kind of thing. Well, it's, it's kicked in in, you know, 21st century. They own it. Okay. 
So is it too young yet to look at anything in the 2001 group? Oh, I don't think so. I think there's some good work that's starting to, to be done out there. Okay, because they're now teens, young exactly. teens, right? Exactly. Okay, so they weren't, they're not quite in the workforce yet, but uh, it'll be interesting to see how much different than the millennials they are. Yeah, I think what we're going to see may be a, a little swing to be a little more conservative. Wow. Maybe. <laughs> you never know. It's, it's like a pendulum. Yeah. It's like a, not a pendulum, but it's like a circle, right? Because yeah. we're... Our, our, the generation that precedes the baby boomers, traditionals, right. builders, whatever, they were, weren't they a little more conservative? Yeah, absolutely. So, are we going back to our to our grandparents <laughs> well, and we'll our grandkids? Well, you know what? There's there's a great book out there called I think it's called uh, The Fourth Turning by Strauss and Howe, and these guys are demographers, and they've mapped out generations for the last 250 years, uh -huh. and they believe that a generation repeats itself every fourth generation. Well, they're Okay, that's it. So see, you're, so you're that, ahead. That, that, that <laughs> well, that proves it, though, because you have right. Gen X. And right. Wow, excellent. I'm going to have You said that was the fourth the turning? The fourth turning. Great fourth book. Turning. Okay. It, it's, it's, a, it's a fascinating read. So what do you... <clears throat> how do you use the knowledge that and the research in your first two books to help a hiring manager successfully hire millennials? Well, you know, number one is... What I teach, let me start with what I teach millennials, is learn how to talk to adults. Okay. They are adults, though. They are, but authority figures, or people okay. are, I'll give you a story. Old people. A young man that was out on the green putting, I, I like to play golf, and he's practicing, he's probably 12, and he's walking around, stopping to talk to people, and then putting, and he finally gets to me, and I said, Daniel, you're practicing your putting, and he says, no, I'm practicing talking to adults. Wow. And he was trying to get comfortable with that. So for millennials, I would say the people that get promoted, the people that get hired, the people that get the opportunities are the people that managers believe they can trust. Well, how can you trust somebody you can't have a conversation with? Right. Okay, so from the millennial perspective, make it, practice it, it speaking to authority figures and being comfortable in your conversation. When it comes to a manager, I would, I would caution to say, just because somebody has a conversation with you, right. you might be passing up a lot of skill out there of millennials who don't have that competency or who are not as good at that. And so what I would do is I would give them special projects. I would give them you know, things to go fix. You know, show me how to do this process a better way. Okay. And that's how you can identify. I also believe that... You know, when, when we look at training, is that th there are different theories. You know, like when you're promoting people, uh, you have the draft board theory to say, okay, all of us as managers get in the room, we see pictures on the wall, and we pick them and we promote them. Yeah. And then there's another one that, that says, okay, let's provide opportunities, and people will self-select yes. to move forward. And one of the ways, I think, to identify the high-performing millennials mm -hmm. is create opportunities that they can self-select to do. Okay. Without assigning them to it. Yeah. Okay. So, do you think, and we're talking with Dr. Chip Espinoza, professor and author of multiple books, but the one we're talking about is Millennials at Work. Do you see the Millennials, as they are now becoming managers, uh, redefining business, th the way business is done, or, or going back to the traditional things that baby boomers and Gen Xers are doing? I mean, do you think the business will change based on the preponderance at some point of millennials in the workforce? I think there are bu business fundamentals that aren't going to change, okay. but I think the way we do business will change, and I think we've already seen that happen. W one of the things they do is they really want to blend work and life. Yes. So this idea... And rightfully so, yeah, thank it, you very much. Well, in today's, right? in today's world with technology, you know, why can't you do that? And so... Well, but I look at some of the boomers and I think, man, some of us... Uh, present company excluded, but worked so hard for the man that th right. there wasn't really a reciprocal relationship there. And I think millennials are smarter about that than we were. Right. Yeah, and they, and absolutely. They, they should have work-life balance all the way through, not right. at the end when you retire, then you get your work-life back or your balance. They should right. have balance all the way through. Yeah, exactly. Or at least, or, or what's funny is they don't, but here's the thing, Richard, they don't mind working 24-7. Really? If they can access their private life during work, They'll access work during their private life. Okay. They don't mind doing that. It's just when the lines are drawn, and that's where they have a struggle. Wow. Because I think 
uh, personally speaking, that here, at least in North America, the U.S., we're leaving uh, the millennials a lot of pretty thorny challenges to figure out. Oh, man. Whether it's debt at a federal level, a state level, a government level, a personal level, the environment. We, we're leaving them a lot of things that they're going to have to be very creative to fix. Yeah, I've, I've stayed out of the sociopolitical realm of discussion a lot. Good. Um, but I have been concerned that nobody seems to be caring about that topic, about student debt, yes, about Social Security, all these things. Matter of fact, I was on, on a, a call the other day with um, President Obama's pollster that he had in Chicago and then got uh -huh. him into the White House. And they're upset because they think they're underperforming with the millennial po population. They think that they should do better with that age group okay as far as the turnout for voting and everything yeah historically they have and and i've had conversations with republicans that they just say young people don't care about debt and they're not <laughs> having that conversation and i just i kind of scratch my it's head almost ridiculous it is and, and and not to throw stones at no. anybody but i do think that you bring something up that is really really important and not only, I mean, look at the county of Orange. 60% of the workforce is eligible for retirement in the next three to four years. Wow. They've been able to offer pensions, great plans for them, health right. plans. Right. Those things are going away in right. municipalities today. How are you going to recruit the best and brightest to stay 20 to 30 years? Yeah. I'm concerned about that. Yeah, and I, and I think, I think, being a parent of two millennials, uh, Dr. Chip Espinoza, that we did a pretty good job raising a generation that's going to redefine some elements of business and I think bring balance into the workforce and I, I, I am overwhelmed at their skill level and I, I'm, on, I'm on the side of saying they're misunderstood, they have more talent than we see. We, the boomers, may be the ones who have too many shades on our glasses that we can't see the reality of the future. Yeah, I, I, I think there's a lot to that. One thing I would caution millennials out there or anybody yes, is that I wonder when they're betting their own money, if they'll have the stomach for entrepreneurship, all these different things wow. that we're talking about today. Okay. And as long as the risk is not totally on them, will they be willing to, to, to put that risk out oh, there? Okay. And, that, and that's something that I, I think deserves a discussion. I mean, we've put a real well, that's emphasis. An point. We've put a real emphasis on safety yeah. in this generation. Right. And almost, we've anesthetized them from all Risk. kinds of things. Right. Risk. Right. And so, wow. th that's something. You that bring that point up when <laughs> I'm out of time on this radio show. <laughs> okay, another visit. The, the deepest <laughs> thought we had today. That's my well, trick. There you go. <laughs> Leave him wanting more. That's Dr. Chip Espinosa. Do you see? We just touched the surface on what this man knows. We're going to have to have you back to kind of explore that. Maybe you can research it and write a book, and we can look at it a little bit. Right. I think that's a fun fundamental issue that needs to be addressed because we need entrepreneurship in this country. All right. Well, I'm s thanks again for coming back. If someone wants to buy your books, what do you tell them to do? Go to Amazon.com. Of course. Uh, uh, you know, Barnes & Noble. And do what? Just What's your name? Chip Espinosa. Or you can go to um, Millennials at work.com. Okay. We've, we've got a Kickstarter campaign because oh, we're do? trying to get this book in every millennial's hand that we can. Okay. You can sign up there. There are all kinds of things you can You get a key, buy a keynote from me where I can come and go speak to your group wow. Kickstarter. or book or well, whatever. How do they find it on Kickstarter? Uh, all you do is go to www.millennialsatwork and you spell out at. It won't work with that. Okay. You know, so yeah. millennialsatwork.com and there's a link right there okay. to go to the Kickstarter or to buy the book. And your last name is spelled how? E S P I N O Z A. There you go, Dr. Chip Espinoza. Thank you for giving again. And we are, I'm serious, I want to have you, our producers here in the studio. We're going to have you back at some okay. point, okay? Great. After you get back from your trips and all the other things that you're doing. Thanks for being a friend of the program. Right. Thank you, Rich. Uh, all right, we're going to we're gonna wrap it up here because we are out of time. I'd like to thank our advertisers for supporting the show, Brandman University, Decision Toolbox, MBN Design, Smart Business Magazine, SNH Rubber, Succession Strategies, Tone Software, and UPS Protection. All the wonderful staff that helped to make this show so wonderful, starting with our producer. Uh, who, what's our producer's name? Crystal. Oh, that's right. She's standing right here. Crystal Nunley. And the rest of the team. Thank you. We're out of time. I'm being rushed, so I've just got to end it. And if you'd like to learn more about us, Critical Mass for Business is our website. Until the next show, this is Rick Franzi saying I hope all of your decisions will move your company in a positive direction.